Hey guys, Solomon here. I hope you're having a great day. In today's video, we got our 83rd Hippopotamus Defense video and our second masterclass session on it, okay? I recently made a video, a masterclass hippo video, in which case we didn't focus on the beginning moves. In fact, we didn't really even cover what the hippo was. This is more for you Hippopotamus Defense players who have been playing this. You know what it is. You know your move order. You're just trying to get better at the middle game. We're focusing on the breather moment. What is that? It's when, well, I made it up first off, okay? So if you didn't know, don't feel bad. Um, but what is it? It's it's when you get that full thick skin tippo, you're playing in the middle game, right? You just reached the middle game. You got your six pawns on the sixth rank, the two knights tuck, the two feet and kettle bishops. What do we do now, right? For the first time in the game, we actually kind of have to think about what we're going to do because up until that point, we're kind of just doing what we always do to get into our setup, okay? Now, in that first video, I covered four middle game positions and we talked about it. We're going to do the same thing today, okay? All four of these were from personal games of mine in tournament play. Uh, and, uh, yeah, I, I managed to, uh, by God's grace, hit the national master title by playing nothing but the hippo exclusively as white and black. And, um, these are some of those games that I played along the way to that title. Now this first position here, I just played this move of a six, right? As I said, we got, we got our, we got our full hippo now, right? I mean, up until this point, it's, it's very, you know, repetitive what we're doing every game, right? One, two, three, right? We're just getting into our setup. Right? We're doing our thing. Now we have to think for a second because we're in our setup now. We're in our setup. What do we do now? Right Now, against the move of E5, I don't always push. Sometimes that's a good idea, but it's not always the best move. Okay. For example, in this position, right? In this position here, is D5 losing? No. Right? But notice that them playing E5 we can actually decide to capture if we want to, right? And this knight is feeling a little bit weak on that square. On top of that, if we do see a move like e5, even, even if we just improve our knight or something, if they take, we capture back, our queen is able to defend both of these pawns that no longer have a pawn on c7 defending them. On the flip side, right? When we see a move like d5, when white threatens to take, our king can't do what the queen can do on the queen side. Right, so e5, it takes some thinking. Do we take the knight? Do we, um, do we take the pawn? Do we push? Whenever I see d5, nearly every time, right? Just, just lock it up, okay? Because the fact of the matter is that e6, because the king can't defend it, is weaker than d6, okay? In this case, I lock it up. My opponent goes to h2. Well, what do we do now, right? And, and something I'll often ask my students is, okay, we have this kind of position. In the hippo, if the center is locked up, you're going to get two kinds of positions. One of them is a French type structure, and the other is a King's Indian defense type structure, okay? First off, the French. The French is as if we have this kind of structure, right? Black has this, white has this, right? This is more of a King's Indian defense pawn structure in the sense that our pawns are here, white's pawns are here. One of these pawns, we want to push like crazy. The other one, we never want to move, ever okay under i mean maybe in the end game maybe i don't even know okay well which pawn do we not want to move we don't want to move this pawn ever why because whether we go here or here in either case white takes all of a sudden d6 is extremely weak it's backwards there's a battery ram on it and white also earned for themselves this d5 square to jump a piece into if they want to like of course they can just take the pawn but d5 is very weak now for the rest of this game no pawn for black can defend it this simply does not help us right how does c5 help us it doesn't okay now on the flip side in this situation right this pawn is free to roam like crazy okay the reason for that right if we play here white takes this pawn's weak the bishop flies in this this square if we play f5 what does what does white get out of that i don't know right it's different and the basic rule of thumb is is looking at okay which one of these pawns is the is the furthest away from us the pawn furthest away from us the pawn in the back of the chain is the weak one that's the one we want to go after right in this case I play the move of f5 and, and just to you know kind of highlight things a little bit better if e5 is played again and in, in this case i probably wouldn't play d5 but it's still very playable um you know in fact as i look at it if if i had a, a student tell me they made this move I, I don't think it's bad at all right i mean we're gonna get some great king side uh, queen side expansion there but let's say this bishop moves okay to to b3 or something now in this case are we gonna push f5 never 
please don't. Okay, for a number of reasons. Generally speaking, if white takes, this pawn is very weak. E5 is a target. G6 is weak. What are we doing? Okay, but on the flip side, if you play C5 and white takes, what's weak? Nothing. We're good, right? There's no backwards pawn. There's no you know pawn that there's no square that white just got. In fact, black's kind of wiping out half of the fourth rank. Okay, so. We're doing pretty good there. So all that to say, when you get a pawn lockup, just, just make a note. Okay, one of these pawns is always going to be ready to roam like crazy. One of them you're never going to touch. Please, okay, please don't touch this pawn. If you're in a King's Indian defense setup and this pawn is far away, you want to go after this pawn. You don't want to play here and let their advanced pawn on passant you and give you weaknesses. Okay, so... All I'd say, I think, I think you guys get the point. Hopefully, if you have questions, let me know down in the comment section below. I play this move at F5, right? This pawn's free to go, right? If you want to take me, that's fine. I'm just going to take back with my pawn. I'm chilling, all right? And um, and yeah, if, if F4, which is what happened in the game, this is an interesting moment, okay? Now, the, the engine likes F takes E4. I actually played the move of E takes f4 which i i don't regret i think that this move is completely fine i played this so that this bishop could become active okay bishop captures back what would you play here all right there's a there's a few good moves b5 is a really good move uh you know equal position according to the engine um you know knight c5 is also good i played the move of knight e5 attacking that bishop the bishop drops back I just keep developing. Notice how, guys, I'm not in a rush to castle. Most chess openings, we're trying to castle very quickly. In the hippo, we're not. Now, there's some instances that we will castle quickly, and I actually want to, you know, go over that. Um, you know, when to castle, when not to castle, where to castle, that kind of thing. Um, but oftentimes, guys, it's move 15. We haven't even castled yet. The reason this is so valuable is because in the hippo, our king is safe. Our king is safe in the center. It's got two pawns, two knights, a queen right next to it. It's safe. It's tucked in. It's not feeling the heat. But the opponent doesn't know where the heck we're going, right? If they start attacking on the king side, boom, we go to the other side. If they attack on the queen side, boom, we go to the king side. It's hard for, for the opponent to guess where our king's going to go when in this position our king can literally be on, on g8 or c8 in, an, in, a, in a blink, okay? Now in the game, we have this move of bishop takes. I ended up capturing back with my bishop. Now here, I actually took a lot of time after pawn takes f5. Um, I think that knight takes f5 is a very valid option. Uh, but I actually went up with, I, I came out with castle and queen set. And I was hoping my opponent would take this pawn. The reason for that is because I take back. Now, by the way, if they didn't take, I'll win the pawn back. But since they did take, I capture back. I'm threatening h4, right? And uh, when my opponent stops this, there was a bigger threat in mind, and that's bishop f4. The queen is pinned to the king, the queen is done, and my opponent resigns the game. Okay, so just keep that in mind, right? When you're playing the hippo, when you get that locked up position, you're going to have a pawn that's going to be free to roam like crazy. You're going to have a pawn that you just need to keep it there. Just, just please, I'm begging you, keep the pawn there. One of them should never move. One of them needs to move like crazy. I digress. We have this next position here. Okay. Now, again, feel free, guys. Feel free. Just as I talked about in the first video, feel free to pause this and think about what you would play. Okay. In the game here, we have bishop g6. Now, black here, they, they didn't go for a full center, right? They kind of went with this pyramid setup. They dropped the bishop to g6. Uh, and most of the time, I would play this move of a3. I almost played it. Okay. And I, there's nothing wrong with a3. If you were going to play a3, great move. Two thumbs up. Okay. In this case, though, I realized, you know, I can play a3 whenever, but I have an opportunity here to make some space on the king side, so I did it. Now, usually, I'm very uh, careful to push with either g4 or g5 because it's on the king side, and it does impact my king's safety, potentially. And oftentimes, white hat, you know, or in this case, black has a pawn e5. They have a battery ram with the bishop, and obviously, that's a knight and a pawn, but let's just imagine for a second. There's a pawn here, a bishop on e6, a queen coming after this pawn, maybe h5 supported by a rook. They're going crazy. We got to be careful. But in this case, if black plays h5, they only got an, a knight and a pawn on it. That's all they got. Okay. And we can play this move um, of g5 if we want to. We can also play knight f4. Knight f4 is a very solid option here. Okay. Um, you know, if you want to take on, on g4, that's fine. We'll capture back. 
Okay, we're, we're, we're threatening to, to take this bishop and really mess up your pawn structure, potentially, at some point. If you bring the bishop back, g5, queen h5, crushing position for white, right? Going back again, okay, let's say we see h5, we play knight f4. Let's say this bishop runs away. Let's push. Let's, let's kick this knight all the way back. Let's play this move of h4, defending the pawn. We could have taken, right? We could have took that pawn, but then we lose our pawn. So let's defend ours. Now, if you want to save your pawn, you only have two moves. One of them is this move of, of bishop g6. And uh, by the way, that doesn't do anything because, right, you, uh, you're still losing the pawn. So really, that's not a, a sufficient option, even though it tries to defend the pawn. The only way to hold on to it is g6. I like this position for white. Let, let's just compare activity for a second. Which knights are better? I'm going to say ours. I mean, what are these knights doing? Right? Which queen is better? I think ours is better. A lot more range than this queen has. Okay? And really where, what stands out to me are the bishops. Okay? Is our dark sword bishop better than theirs? 100%. Our bishop is slicing and dicing all the way down to h8, a square right next to the king. Is our light squared bishop super special right now? It's nothing crazy. I do think a move like bishop h3 at some point could be a good idea, but it's a lot better than this one. This is textbook bad bishop. If you look up a bad bishop in a dictionary, you might see this position. This is bad. This is terrible. This is, should I keep going? You get the point, okay? And what's the only way that this bishop can ever get out? You know, right, by going to g8 at some point and pushing this pawn at, whoa, wait a second, we talked about this. In this kind of setup, f5, very weakening to black, right? Let's say we play a move like castling kingside. f5, boom, e6 is hanging in this case, right? So first off, they got to figure out e6. On top of that, they got to figure out if it's okay for us to play en passant. And um, yeah, there's just a whole bunch of issues there for black, okay? So I play the move g4. Usually I'm worried about h5, but in this position, that bishop there, I mean, we can attack it, you know, double up black's pawns, mess up their pawn structure. We're, we're on the driver's seat here. We see this move of e5. What would you play here? I ended up playing this move of knight g3. I almost always tuck my knight right away. This is a great way in the hippo, right? If there's no immediate way to push a flank pawn, if there's no immediate way to just slow hippo equals good hippo. Remind yourself of that, right? The hippo is not an opening where we need to figure out how to win. In this position, guys, I don't know how I'm going to win ever. But what I do know is how to keep slowly improving my position, okay? Some openings, right? Uh, just throw fireworks at you at move three, at move four, at move five, fireworks, right? Um, crazy stuff happening. And, and that's partly why I think a lot of players think that the hippo is passive is because it's it's it doesn't do that, right? In the first 10 moves, we're not trying to win anything. We're just trying to get our setup. But what I will say is that the hippo is more like a small fire, right? Right, a small little fire, maybe a little campfire to start, Okay cooking s'mores or something. I don't know. What am I saying? I don't know. Uh, but you know, you start small, right? You get twigs, right? You get little leaves, you, and then you keep building it up more and more. Each move just keeps slowly improving it before you know it, you got a huge fire, right? And the hippopotamus defense really has a ton of attacking play, but you have to work your way up to it. In my last tournament where I hit the national master title, I, uh, I won all six games, but Five of those games uh, resulted in uh, very successful attacks against the enemy king, right? Um, maybe four, because this one might not completely count. But I am attacking on the king side, okay? Now, the games I didn't win, there weren't attacks on the king side, but I still had some some great play, great fiend cut of bishop slicing and dicing and that kind of thing, okay? So just, just remember, guys, just, you know, when people tell you, oh, the hippo's timid the, the hippo can get crushed which i made a video on that recently as you, you guys may have saw um just remember it's it we're not trying to win the game right away and that's okay right we we have a small little fire and every move we just make little incremental improvements this move here is the knight better here than it was there 100 percent, right the knight covers some great squares it's tucked what did black get out of this the only thing black got out of this whole thing is the h4 square being weak but this knight is four moves away from getting there on an empty board, let alone on a full one. So, you know, I like this position uh, for the white side. Okay. Now, rookie eight is played here. 
if you want to, you can pause the video and figure out what you would do. Um, this is a common mistake that I see. Okay, remember, this is an over-the-board tournament against a 1900. Rookie 8 is a blunder because of G5. This will happen, right? You're playing the hippo. You're just slowly improving. You're so, all of a sudden, G5, this knight is trapped. This knight has nowhere to go. Nowhere safe, right? We have everything covered. H5 covered by two pieces. G4 and E4 covered by two pawns. And this knight just got rid of its um, options of escape, right? From there, uh, the game went pretty smoothly. I mean, I'm, I'm about to be up a piece, okay? Now, let's look at the next game. Now, here... We have a three pawn center, okay? And my opponent plays this move of bishop c2. Now, I actually didn't even consider a6. As I've talked about uh, on this channel before, um, you know, when I see a pawn on c4, there's really no point of playing a6 because a6 is meant for, for three reasons, okay? The first two are eliminated because first off, we play a6 to play b5. Oh wait, we can never do that because there's a pawn on c4. The second one is to, to help you know, prepare against a5 from white with b5. Again, we can't play b5. There's a pawn on c4. The only, the only reason a6 would ever be good is if we play c5, we're trying to play c5, and we're trying to prevent knight b5, right? But in that case, I mean, you know, we're not going to play c5 anyways. c5 is a terrible idea because, you know, white can double up, white can take, they have an open file against our pawn. So in that, in that position, I wouldn't even think about playing this move of, of a6, okay? What would you play here? What would you play here? Okay. There's some solid moves. In fact, uh, the top two moves, according to the engine, top three maybe, I didn't play. I didn't play them. Do I regret the move I played? No. Okay. But, you know, there there's solid moves here. One of them is knight f6. Knight f6 is a solid move. Nothing wrong with that. You're, you know, you're eyeing up this pawn a little bit. You're potentially coming to g4 to try to win that bishop or at least pester it a little bit. Um, knight c6 is a computer move. I, I don't recommend that. Uh, you know, and, and that's the thing. When you look at the computer moves, it's going to tell you moves here like c6, c5. Guys, we got we to gotta remember there's a human element to this, right? And practically speaking, playing a move like c5, what are we doing? White just takes full control of the center and we're about to get blasted. Okay, we want to open up a file that cannot have major pieces on it. And because of that reason, I play the move of f5. There's a bishop here. If you put a rook here, I'm not that scared. First off, there's nothing there right now. On top of that, there's a bishop in the way. My opponent here plays the move of knight h4. And in this case, we can win material. I play the move of f4. Anytime you play this flank pawn move and they have a battery ram and they bring their knight to the edge, you can play this pawn up. And after bishop takes, which they, I mean, I guess they don't have to, but if they don't, we're going to win a piece. Once they do it, we play g5. We are forking both of these pieces. Right. Now in the game, queen e2 is played. Um, and I'll just show you that real quickly. The game continued like so. This might look scary, but it turns out black is completely fine. G6 is covered. If you want to bring your knight in, go ahead. We'll just trade down, which is good with me because I'm defending. E5 is played. I take it. D5 is played. I take it. I play queen e8 here, offering a trade. Um, I, I do trade here with G6. And um, yeah, I, you know, black, you know, I went on here to, to win a pretty straightforward game. Um, you know, nearly minus four for black here. Okay. All I have to say, though, going back to G5, you might be wondering, wait, we just lost a pawn. What if white sacks and gets three pawns for the piece with three open files? That might look dangerous. Well, the problem is we have bishop f6. Check is not available. The rook, check is not available. The knight, when the queen moves, we win a piece. Now we got two pieces for three pawns. Okay. So just remember that little trick. I just wanted to include that in there. Okay, that's a fun little trick that you can use from time to time if your opponent has a battery ram and they bring their knight to the edge. Our final position here, uh, this is one of my earliest wins uh, with the hippo, uh, hippopotamus defense. I think my second win ever um, in tournament chess is my third game. And um, all right, what do we do here? All right, this is a little bit different. You might notice the pawn is on b5 instead of b6. The reason for that is because I decided to get tempo on that bishop. Um, would I get tempo now? Probably not. I'm not sure. I, I, I've kind of reserved my pawns a little bit more until I get my full hippo and then I start to try to get tempo. But I mean, it's still a very solid position here for black. What would you do? Oftentimes when, when white has pawns here, I'll take space depending on where their pieces are, obviously, right? If, if white has pawns here, right? I'll take space. But before that, I decide to tuck my knight, right? Tuck my knight. I'm, I'm big on this. The knight here, just gaining activity, gaining space. Again, 
just slowly improving. Slow hippo equals good hippo. Rook AE1 is played. C5. I'm not in a rush to win this, guys. I'm not in a rush. I'm not trying to figure out how to checkmate this king. I'm just thinking, let's gain some space. Right? F4 is played. I tuck my queen. Knight G3 is played. I just keep advancing. Okay. Now here in this situation, white could have captured, but I have a lot of reinforcements on that square, which is great. That's a great idea. If you can play B5, uh, knight B6, and prepare a D5 push at some point, you're going to have a ton of pieces helping out there, right? Two knights, a bishop, a pawn, potentially a queen if the queen hasn't moved either. Um, so white there didn't take. And I'm also threatening to, to fork those two pieces. Okay. So I'm threatening to fork those. Uh, white plays here. I end up capturing. Should I castle king side? No. That'd be a terrible move because the queen's very active. The bishop is aimed towards my my king. The rooks are on the king side. I ended up going queen side here. Now, sure, this file is semi-open, but there's a pawn on c2. So white's going to have a hard time breaking this game open uh, against my king. I have a lot more defense, and white's pieces are not that dangerous all of a sudden against my king. Okay. Now, if you want to see the rest of this game and how it transpired, it uh, follows this move of e5. My, my first question for you, do you think that e5 is a good move? Is this a good move for white? And how would you play this position as black going forward? If you want to see how this game finishes out, I will leave a link to that in the description below. And um, again, if you're interested in the hippopotamus defense um, course that I made over six hours in content, um, you know, I'll leave a link to that as well. Uh, I'm a, I'm a fan of the hippo, right? I'm a fan of it. Uh, I think it's way stronger than most people give it credit for. Um, you know, many think that it can just get steamrolled. Many think that it's just slow and timid. Um, I've, yeah, I mean, if you've watched this channel for a long time, you know that I've, you know, that I enjoy playing it. You know that it's been played in the world championship match. You know that grandmasters have lost to it, including Magnus Carlsen. I can keep going. Um, it's good. So I'll say, let me know what you think of E5. Is E5 a good or bad move? And how would you respond to it? If you want to see how I responded to it, you can click that link uh, in the description below. I appreciate y'all. See you on the next one. Hey, thanks for watching today's video. I really quickly wanted to give a shout out to my Patreon community for the month of March in 2024. I appreciate y'all a ton. And um, yeah, if you guys are interested in joining the Patreon community, becoming part of that family, uh, I highly recommend that you go check it out. And I'll see you guys in the next one. Peace. Peace.